exciting new project that we're having. Um, we have been collaborating with other professionals to create a software that uh, can be used as a planning tool, and we'll show you a little bit of that later on. And I would just like to, um, to add that um, through our case studies of effective consultations with end users, we are somehow planting the seeds of what we call citizen architecture. Citizen architecture involves the thoughtful plan and design of structures, not as solitary entities, but the citizens of the community. Structures are planned and designed to leave a lasting impression while uplifting and inspiring the community. It is about making good planning and good design accessible to all and striking a balance among social equity, environmental protection, economic growth, culture, identity, and even spirituality. So let me just um, go over the program for this afternoon session. There have been some um, slight differences in terms of the topics, but um, uh, I'll be starting it off. I'm Abby Bravo. I'm the Operations Manager at Palafox. And I'll be presenting as well as moderating the, this session this afternoon. I'll be talking about global trends and best practices, as well as um, some common issues that we, that we face when we plan or develop communities and cities. And we have um, Mr. Rodney Chapin from Ardura International, um, one of our partners uh, who help us with um, engineering. And uh, we've been working on several projects together in the Philippines, like in Pampanga and in Cebu. And um, he'll be presenting about maximizing the resource value in water, waste, and energy. And then our case studies will include um, the Marawi, uh, Indig Marawi project, which is a housing uh, project for, um, in, for the people in Marawi. And then resilient schools in Nepal. So this is in relation to the earthquake that happened a few years ago in Nepal and how, uh, how Palafox also was involved in the rebuilding of um, some schools in Nepal towards being a resilient structure. And then uh, lastly, we will be presenting Metro Davao. Um, it's an ongoing um, project together with the Mindanao Development Authority. And it's composed of eight different uh, cities and municipalities. And this is where we apply the technology and innovations given the um, given the variety and the complexity of the project. So, um, yeah, and then we'll have a Q&A and uh, wrap up the discussions as well. So, um, in Palafox, we also benchmark from the different um, best practices from around the world, and we've been following global indexes and rankings on different city ideals, whether they are, um, can we, next sustainable, green, smart, urban mobility, um, innovative, resilient, and many more. So over the years, there have been many indexes that indicate which cities are the best in terms of those, um, in terms of those uh, concepts or ideals. And we also see here the rise of Asian cities, um, whereas previously it's more of the Western cities that have topped these categories. Now we see Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo, um, uh, Bangkok, even Kuala Lumpur, and Seoul. Um, and all over the world, cities are realizing the importance of being people-oriented, reconnecting with nature, and using technology to make daily city life efficient. Like what we see in Copenhagen where they are emphasized more on the biking for pedestrians also. And even in, in countries or cities that produce cars, they tend to go away with it. Like for Germany, they have created car-free city as well. And then um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, with this story in um, Seoul, in Um it, This used to be um, a body of water that's... Uh, that has been neglected and so instead of cleaning it up they covered it with a highway and then later on they realized um, that it was a mistake to put the highway over it so they just removed it and cleaned it up as well so now it's creating um, places for people places where they can converge and increase mobility and walkability within the city as well as reviving um, rivers and waterways like in Stockholm uh, in Sweden 
And of course, like what I mentioned earlier, using technology to make uh, daily life easier, like uh, smart technology for transportation, even for waste management. And uh, next, um, and also um, uh, subscribing to the different um, uh, certifications like uh, LED or LEED, and then to create a more intelligent city infrastructure. Even in um, tourism, there's also the concept of sustainability or how will the tourist destinations will be able to cope with increased demand or increased, um, with the increasing tourism market as well. And also there's, um, cities are also becoming um, more and more compact. So like for example in Hong Kong, it's 71% um, open space because they have um, more vertical structures for housing. Yes. And then um, progressive urban design and planning in Chicago. Next. Uh, clean energy. Next. And then of course a lot of them are trying to navigate towards connecting human beings with nature and preserving the environment as well. So th these are different cities in um, Canada where the urban and the uh, forest also uh, converge sustainably. And then next, sustainable organic farming, uh, which is also a, a component of city life, is um, where will the food be coming from, and how will and um, how will travel time from where the food is can be cut short. So in our um, practice in, in Palafox, we have identified several um, issues that our cities and towns are facing um, today. So of course, we already know this. This is actually very timely for us. We've experienced this uh, firsthand, our vulnerability to disasters. So even, even today, like years after Ondoy, we still experience um, flooding and, um, in, in different areas in the metropolitan region. And of course, Solid waste management, wherever we uh, plan cities or communities, this has always been one of the key issues that needs to be resolved, especially in island communities where it's difficult uh, to uh, manage uh, the garbage, especially from tourism. Next. And of course, uh, here in our cities, we have uh, the Payatas dump site as well. And traffic and transportation. So. I guess we, all, we always experience this, long lines and unsafe um, transportation as well. So we, also, we always see in the news that um, the, the MRT stops or there's some sort of accident. Yes. And um, even traffic congestion, uh, it's costing us 3.5 billion pesos a day, according to JICA. So we are losing more and more of our streets uh, to the vehicles. It's more car-oriented. And it's a result of us being citizens of sprawl. I know many of you um, live maybe two or three hours away from Metro Manila. And there's a social cost, there's an economic cost to that as well. Um, even in, um, in neighborhoods outside of the Philippines, when you're a citizen of sprawl, the social costs include like, not being able to, um, to have time for your family or um, not even knowing who your neighbors are because they're spread out um, in different areas. And then of course, just driving along EDSA, you see visual pollution and um, next, lack of affordable housing as well. That's why people live uh, relatively a long way away from Metro Manila or from where they work. And then next, please. Yes, we also noticed that there's there seems to be a lack of a sense of identity in our cities and communities. It does, uh, some cities, in terms of their design or aesthetic, there's no, um, there's no representation of who the citizens are or what is their culture. And so that's what we see whenever we arrive in airports and in seaports as well. And then of course we have environmental degradation drew mainly because of solid, poor solid waste management and even uh, wastewater management and um, clogging of the different um, water bodies or the tributaries. 
And um, in hand with that is um, a seemingly difficulty in um, sourcing water for cities and communities as well, despite us being surrounded by water. So next. And so what, this is how we approach the planning, the architecture, and the engineering for sustainable cities and communities, starting with collaboration. So we make it a point that the team is not just composed of uh, homogenous, um, homogenous professionals, like just environmental planners, but we also make sure that it is a complete team also, that there's um, sociologists, there's also econo economists that are involved in the planning as well. And then alignment, of course, because we don't want to replicate or um, to be redundant with other plans, whether it's national or local plans. So we have to review previous planning initiatives and higher level plans. So we know also where we'll be coming from in terms of how we, um, how we plan and how we design. And as I mentioned earlier, very important is the engagement, identifying and consulting different stakeholders of the project. And um, this is uh, how we also prioritize. So uh, we also prioritize uh, projects or things that can that the LGU or the local government can do in terms of uh, 100 days or up to 100 years. So there are immediate, short-term, medium-term, and long-term um, projects or approach. And then I think this was mentioned earlier, the systems thinking, how you organize uh, is very important as well in terms of the vision and a problem-oriented approach. Next. Um, the, the plan is, should also be, uh, be able to adapt to the changing environment as well. Especially in tourism, um, the landscape is um, changing briefly. Um, I can say this for Shargao as well. It has, it has been developing rather rapidly. So when it comes to planning, um, it should allow adjustments in the planning process, but not strain from the objectives and requirements of the plan. And of course, enhanced by leveraging existing uses and strengths. Uh, protection, uh, protect, plan sustainably, long-term success will depend on the quality of environment and the unique sense of place. And then this is of course uh, very important as well is to connect since you're developing uh, you're developing a community or a city not as an island but as a as part of the larger urban fabric or a larger part of um, the Philippines or development and in some cases there's also a need to promote so you have to talk or to engage with your citizens you have to engage with um, um, investors so uh, we also do we also in, we are also involved in creating a marketing program in every in, in some projects that we do as well. And then um, our approach is also to be more visual, so that when we talk to our stakeholders or even to local government, they have this vision or an idea of how development can go um, in their ex from their existing situation and um, years into their future. So, for example, we have here a picture of Estela de la Reina in, Estela de la Reina in Manila, existing, and that's the um, proposed. And then Estela de San Miguel, existing, and this is proposed with uh, on-site housing. Ermitaño Creek in San Juan, and this is uh, the proposed in the future with mixed-use housing as well. And then uh, presently in North Harbor Housing in Manila, so we just um, reimagine, redesign um, the different um, areas or blighted areas in the community. So for example, this is the aerial view of Pasig River today. And in the future, this is what we, uh, we hope it would look like as well. And then uh, we also have projects in San Pedro Laguna. And um, we also try to redesign and reimagine those areas. And this one is in San Fernando, Pampanga. And we try to make it more walkable and safer for the people to cross the street. And then Kandaba Wetlands also in Pampanga. Turn it into something, uh, a tourist, tourism um, area. And then Ilocos Norte Tourism Master Plan back in 2012. 
So this is one of the, this area was uh, one of the schools. So we wanted the school area or the academic area to be walkable and safe, better lighted for the children as well. And then some areas in Zamboanga City, Paseo del Mar. So that's the future. So in, a, in gist, um, the, the kind of development that we want, that we would like to impart in the cities and communities we work in, is environmental, environment friendly cities and communities that are connected, accessible, walkable, biteable, safer, better lighted, convenient, clean, mixed income, and cross generational. Um, place, with places to live, workshop, uh, dine, learn, worship, with healthcare, recreation, and leisure. And with that, uh, there's also 24 hour cycle of activities. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to come speak, and uh, thanks for sticking around. A big crowd, so uh, that's nice to see. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak, as Abby mentioned, on uh, what I've titled, uh, titled uh, Maximizing uh, Resource Value and Water Waste and Energy. And then I, I, I've subtitled it uh, Leapfrogging to Better Solutions. So uh, I'll, I'll hopefully explain what that means during my presentation. Um, next slide. By, by way of uh, schedule, so you know what I'm going to do, uh, just uh, give an introduction. And then I've uh, ordered it like this. We'll talk about the challenge uh, and then the opportunity, a little bit about the old way of doing things versus the new way of doing things. Um, and then I'll step a little deeper into the water perspective and the waste perspective and then uh, talk about a solution that is uh, that includes b both of those. Um, and, and then the financials and the next steps. And I, I want to stop on the financials for a moment. Uh, maybe uh, somewhat different than a lot of the speakers or people participating here. I'm, uh, I'm in the private sector. I'm a business person. And uh, one thing I've learned in my career is that uh, it's difficult to get things to move if there's not an economic driver or if there's not a financial return. So I'm spending a lot of my time focused in this sector on addressing the problems to those economic barriers and how we can make this a financially viable uh, approach to dealing with water and waste and energy. So just so you understand, that's the perspective from, from which I come. Uh, so just a little about me, the boring part. Uh, I, I've been in this business a long time. I'm an engineer by training. My background is in water and, and, and waste. I'm from the US, but I've been working in Asia now for uh, close to 10 years. Uh, so I, I, I understand the perspectives and the problems that we have in, in Asia and these sectors. Uh, and my expertise is, again, in this, in this uh, sector of water and waste. So let's dive into uh, the subject matter. So I, 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 I try to look at, before we solve the problem, what is our challenge? And I'm focusing the challenge uh, in terms of where we are today and where we want to go in dealing with what I think most people see as a problem, right? People see the challenges of finding water, uh, the challenges of treating wastewater and not polluting our rivers and streams, and the challenges of keeping the trash <laughs> off the streets uh, and out of the streams and the rivers, as we just saw in Abby's presentation. But to me, this is, this is a challenge as to how we really focus on turning these into resources, not on how we spend our money to, to treat the problem. So, in my opinion, you know, we have to reimagine this. Um, and we, in doing so, we take advantage of a few things. One, that there is value in these resources, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, now, there are solutions, there are technologies available that allow us to mine those resources. Uh, there is a lot of government and multilateral support. I know there's a lot of the multilateral agencies in the room. There's a lot of support for renewable energy, for uh, resource extraction, and, and in the also water and waste problems. Uh, there, there are opportunities for regional development where we combine some of these issues, whether it's an agricultural issue combined with a municipal issue, uh, combined with a regional issue. We can take advantage of that. And there's a lot of investment out there. I, again, as I said, I'm a business person and I work a lot with private developers 
uh, focused on investing in these sectors. There's a lot of money and a lot of interest that we can capitalize on to, to do this. So if we take advantage of all of those things, we can drive this to a financially sustainable, uh, environmentally sustainable uh, balance and solution. So let, let's talk a little bit about leapfrogging. I, some of you may remember it as a game you played as a, as a child, right, where we hop over the person in front of us to go in front of them. There's a lot of talk about leapfrogging in the business world, right, and primarily in the communications sector, the, the energy sector, uh, and the banking sector. So we've seen in developing countries, particularly in Africa, the, the, the leapfrogging of landline phones to cell phones. Uh, m many people in these countries never had what I had when I was a child in the U.S. where we had the rotary dial and we called on the landline, but they've leapt to what is a better technology, uh, a cell phone, that they can take with you everywhere you go. We see the same thing in energy, where uh, the combination of renewables and microgrids and batteries have allowed remote areas that don't have power and electricity to implement affordable solutions to capture electricity and power and use it locally. And then we've also seen this in the banking sector. I, I, I work all around Asia and I'm actually uh, astounded when I go to some places, China, even Republic of Georgia, at the advances in the banking and financial sectors that are, that are beyond what we have in the U.S., quite frankly. Um, so leapfrogging is occurring in many sectors. And I think, particularly in Asia, we have the opportunity to take advantage of that in the water and the waste and the energy sector. And, and what we see is that, uh, I, I think some of you may know, this is from a World Bank study in 2015 that shows that in Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines, only about 10% of the wastewater is actually treated before it's discharged into a stream or a river. So that's an opportunity in my opinion, not a, not a problem. Uh, we, we have the opportunity to, to forget that old technology and jump to the new technology. And, and also we see this problem in the solid waste sector, that only about 10% of the waste, the solid waste, the trash, is disposed of properly or managed properly in, in Asia. So I think we've seen things like this, right? The, the old way of doing things, and particularly in the solid waste industry, the, the trash industry, uh, that we have dumping, right? We just put it somewhere. We pile it up, we bury it, we throw it in the river, we throw it in the creek, uh, because the financial driver is not there to, to manage it. So it becomes a problem that is dealt with in the, <laughs> the, the, the most efficient way, which is just to throw it somewhere. And then uh, also in the wastewater sector, in the old, the old way of doing things, uh, I'm, a, I'm a wastewater engineer by training, and we, we learned, you know, you put a lot of air into it and a lot of energy into it to convert the, the dirty organic matter into uh, a clean water. But that consumes a lot of energy. That's the old way of doing things. So now we're moving to uh, looking at this again. What are the resources that are in these streams of water or waste? And what can we get out of that? How can we manage that in an effective way to actually generate revenue and not spend money just to, to uh, fix a problem? And there are many of these, and I will talk about some of them uh, now. So first, let's start in the, in the water cycle. Uh, I think we all understand, uh, as we live in a city or a community, that we turn on the tap, we have water, some of us, some places still, still do not, uh, many places still do not, but we turn on the tap, we have water, maybe it's drinkable, maybe it's not, but we can certainly use it to cook and wash our clothes. And then we use that water in, in many ways inside the city. And then the dirty water, when we flush that toilet or turn on that sink, that water goes somewhere. Uh, it, it needs to be treated, and in the Philippines in particular, there's a big push to, to implement the treatment and to a very high degree with very high standards. And that takes a lot of energy and a lot of uh, chemicals to do that as well. So what we have is a challenge, right? Not only do we need to bring water and we need to treat water before it's discharged into a stream, but we have to spend a lot of money to do that, to build structures, to, to uh, consume electricity and chemicals. So, so what, what we look at is how do we minimize the expenditure of energy in this cycle, and then how do we maximize the resources? And what we see, if we just look at the, 
the wastewater, the, the dirty water side of that, is that there's actually a lot of energy embedded in that, in that wastewater. You might not think that, right? But uh, if you look at the science and the people who have studied this a lot, and there's been a lot of study in this, this regard, the, the available energy in wastewater is probably three to four times the energy required to properly treat uh, and handle that wastewater. The difficulty, right, is in <laughs> is doing that efficiently. And, and I won't go into the details of this complicated picture on the right, but what it shows is that there's probably an optimum point that we can reach uh, in, in extracting that energy and minimizing the energy. But what we do know and what has been proven is that we can actually treat and dispose of and handle that wastewater problem in an energy negative way, meaning we can actually make more energy than we consume to do that. The way that we do that, and, and again, uh, technical, so I won't go into too much detail, but very simply, as opposed to the old way, which we just tried to convert the organics to water and carbon dioxide and get rid of them in whatever way we could, now we focus on extracting the organics and not wasting them. Uh, and by doing so, we can actually lower the energy cost of treating the wastewater, and we can pull those organics out uh, and, and to the tune of maybe 70 to 80 percent of those and take those into an anaerobic digester and produce biogas that can be used for heat or uh, to uh, power uh, gas-driven vehicles or to produce electricity. And as I said, there are examples. One, uh, the, the biggest, the best case study is in Austria, the Strauss wastewater treatment plant that has been now for more than 10 years energy negative. Uh, if you see here, they, they produce uh, about 10% more energy than they require to run the plant. And now they've been, begun bringing in other waste, food waste and other things. And now they're about 200% uh, with uh, energy production over energy consumption. But in my opinion, we can do better. Uh, we can actually still pour, pull more nutrients out and we can combine these, these problems, these issues that we have between water and solid waste and extract even more resources. An example of this is in Washington, D.C., a project that I worked on uh, several years ago where they now, not only do they produce a lot of electricity by extracting these organics, but they produce uh, $3 million worth of fertilizer that they sell in the retail outlets uh, around Washington, D.C. So there are a lot of resources that we can mine on the water side. So the same exists in the solid waste. The same exists on the trash side. Uh, these are exciting topics just after lunch, I, I, I know. But uh, the, the same uh, dynamic exists, is that there is value in the waste. This is just uh, a slide that shows the potential energy value of the first column, MSW, means municipal solid waste, and then other discrete waste, green waste, wood chips, bamboo, oils, and grease, and uh, plastics. But you can see that there is a potential for a lot of energy, and to put that in context, if we look at one trash truck, as we call it, that maybe has a 10-ton capacity, that 10-ton capacity truck uh, has enough energy in it to power one to two average homes in Asia for a year. That's a tremendous value. And in most places that I work, uh, certainly in developing Asia, we are not tapping any of that energy. Uh, so it's a huge potential that we have. Now, the reason we're not tapping that is that it's been difficult to do. Uh, but, but a lot of advances have been made in technology and a lot of approaches are being implemented, actually one here in Metro Manila, to where we actually look at uh, how do we best separate and take the waste because most of the trash as we know it in, in Asia is not trash. A lot of it's food waste, sometimes 50, 60 percent. That's very wet waste. You can imagine it's not easy to burn, which is how we traditionally generate power from solid waste. So there are now uh, a lot of developments that have been implemented to where we separate the wet part through an extrusion process and the dry part and we take the wet part into a digester, we make gas, we take the dry part into an incinerator or a gasifier and combust it to make energy. So we have, we've seen the technology advances to address these, these issues. 
I, I won't go into the details here because this is very technical, but there are a lot of technologies available to convert a waste, a solid waste product, paper, uh, wood products, uh, plastics, to energy. And there's a full spectrum, incineration to gasification to even what's called plasma arc gasification. Each has its advantages and its cost structures. But the point to make here is that one of these technologies and all of these technologies have advanced to the point that they've become very efficient. And gasification, for example, uh, is a process, uh, a thermochemical process, where we, we convert the organics um, uh, and the carbon-based uh, waste into a syngas. It's, it's only hydrogen and carbon monoxide that we can then uh, burn in a generator uh, with no emissions to produce electricity. And the only byproducts of this are biochar, which can be used as a soil amendment or a fertilizer, and carbon black, which, if you know anything about the manufacturing industry, has a value of over a thousand dollars per ton. So we can extract three, at least three resources uh, through this process, and at quite a high efficiency, almost 40 percent conversion to electricity. So that's the, the, the details and the technical part on the water side and on the solid waste side. The real solution here, the real, uh, the way to make this pay from a business person's perspective, the way to make it work, is that we have to look at combining these issues and combining these resources into one system. So we have water issues, we have agricultural waste, we have municipal waste, we have industrial waste, we have wastewater. Let's look at all of those together and co-manage them to extract the maximum value out of that. So how do we do that? Uh, I'm sure, uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll send this to anyone who wants it because this is a complicated slide, but the, the points I want to make from this is if you see the green arrows coming out of this, if we were to start from scratch, which in, in many places in the developing world we have this opportunity, and implement a wastewater and a solid waste management solution and implement them together. We have the opportunity to create many revenue streams. Now, starting with the heat in the wastewater, okay, that won't work in the Philippines, but if you're in northern China or Mongolia where it's very cold, you can take the heat and use that as a resource. But we can produce recycled water, we can produce nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus that we can use in the agricultural field. We can produce electricity through two streams. We can pull out the recyclables. We can produce organic fertilizers. And we can produce, as I said, biochar and carbon black. These are with proven technologies and uh, accessible technologies that are available to us today. If we implement all of them together, and again, look at maximizing the, the resource pulling it out in the easiest and least costly way, uh, and then uh, dealing with the least amount of waste in the end. And you see in this model, we're probably talking in the end of less than 10% that we have to get rid of. So uh, not a lot of waste at the end of this, end of this process. And I would, I would also say, to jump back to the Philippines, the new Philippines standards for effluent of wastewater are very, very strict on, on anyone's scale, international scale. Um, so looking at recycling that water and reusing it rather than discharging it, it's probably going to be cheaper than treating it to those new standards. So it's another approach that we should look at. And then, uh, again, as I started this presentation, um, next slide, uh, I think, I'm a, as I said, I'm a business person. And the big, the big point here is, is that there's a lot of money in, involved in this. If we simply look at uh, a model that I just showed for a million, a population of a million people. So let's say we had a city with no waste or water solution in, in it. And we were going to, to develop it the traditional way versus this new way. We're talking more than $28 million annually, every year, of either resources that we produce or avoided cost by low, low energy solutions that we could, we, could, we could grab by doing things this way. And, and that does not even include, I didn't put in recyclables or the savings in land or the extended social 
and uh, economic impacts that would come from this. So it is very viable, viable and very uh, solvable, uh, even from a purely business focus. So, uh, last slide. Um, <clears throat> the, I've told you the challenge, the opportunity, potentially the solution, but, but there are things that need to be done. I, I think we, we, we certainly have to help governments and agencies uh, see these opportunities because traditionally we're so focused on one part, the water problem or the solid waste problem or the energy problem. We have to look at those together in order to, to capture these, these values. We have to work with these, these technologies that are available to, to implement them together, to adapt them, to bring the cost down to uh, a developing world cost. Uh, <clears throat> and then we must, we must help businesses and investors understand the full value. Part of what I do when I develop these projects is I have to say, look, you understand, you, there's a market for this fertilizer, there's a market for the electricity, here's how you do each one of them. Here's someone who can help you with that supply chain, market that product. You have to pull all of these things together or the projects just don't work. Um, and then lastly, we, we have to continue to drive the industry and the solutions to reach the proper balance uh, the financial balance along with the sustainability and the environmental balance. So, thank you for that. Uh, I'll be available at the end to answer questions. A pleasant afternoon, everyone. Medyo, ito talaga yung oras na nakakaantok. But please bear with me. We'll get over this in a while. Um, so, my topic for this afternoon is about Marawi, a road to recovery. And the concentration of my topic will be on an area, on a specific area in Marawi City and in a specific neighborhood that we designed. And although we didn't design the entire entirety of Marawi City, we're always reminded in the office that how big or small the project is, we're, we always take into consideration its impacts to the residents or the users of the development, to its surroundings and the existing urban fabric or the, the surrounding itself. And like the pieces of the puzzle, each neighborhood or smaller units of developments, when put together, acts as a complete, or when put together, completes the whole picture of a community. So as you can see here, here's a photo of Lanao Lake. So the people of Maranaos, in, if translated, they call, they're called people of the lake. The reason because, um, they are surrounded by Lano Lake, and Lano Lake acts as a vital part in the lives of many of the Maranaos because they get their livelihood there, fishing, for transportation, and also for water source. This is Marawi City, that's 8,755 hectares, and on the southern part of Marawi City is where Lano Lake is located, and housing almost 201, 700, 201,785 residents. So I think most of you are aware of the conflict that has happened in Marawi. Um, the siege and the war brought about by the, by the Mauti group. And this, was, this happened during May 2017. The uh, slide before, the once vibrant city. So these are just snippets of what has happened during that war. Um, a lot of houses and mosques were destroyed, schools and even houses, and most of the houses and the people are, are, are forced to vacate the area. And because of that, this led to people being homeless. And this led to the destruction of buildings, schools, mosques, government centers, and most especially the houses of the many. And about 200,000 plus residents are displaced and doesn't have the choice but to vacate the area. So this left them scarred, longing for their life, that, for the life that they once had in Marawi City. Yet, we're, we remain hopeful and um, with the help of the people, we're going to build back Marawi, a better and safer Marawi. And then here comes our plan for Marawi or for a portion of Marawi City. 
And when the war was neutralized, the company has put forward several recommendations to the government agencies in charge of rehabilitation. In the case of Marawi, it's best to reimagine, replan, re-architecture, redesign, re-engineer, redevelop, renew, reduce, reuse, recycle, and renaissance. And of course, with the help of the local government, next slide, of a non-government organization, uh, mentioned by Ms. Abby earlier, spearheaded by Mr. Robin Padilla himself, the Wanag ng Kapayapan Foundation and Hindig Marawi, in partnership with Palafox Associates and Palafox Architecture Group, together we collaborated and we formed or did the master plan and the architecture of a proposed residential community. So our goal is to create a well-planned residential development equipped with the necessary facilities for community life. And then I decided to um, break down my presentation into these three objectives. First is to design with nature, create a safe, secure, and sustainable environment, and lastly, promote socially sensitive housing. I will discuss further the components of the projects when we go through these objectives. When we design um, communities or cities, we usually take into consideration the international context of the location of the site. So that's Marawi um, in the international setting. And um, zooming in, um, that's the site, and then that's a town proper in Marawi. And Lagindingan Airport is around two hours or 101 kilometers, and Marawi City Town proper, which is a ground zero, is around 400. 4.7 kilometers, which is around one hour to our, to our site. And zooming in further, this is our site, four hectares um, residential development, and then Lano Lake is oriented towards the southern portion. So first, um, design element or criteria that we um, incorporated in the design of the community is to design with nature. Of course, to design with nature, this is the capability of occupying or modifying the earth with best regards to um, taking care or careful considerations of the landscaping and the ecology of the area. Of course, we looked into the elevation of, of the site. Uh, Marawi City is known as the southern capital or capital, summer capital of the south because of its higher elevation. Thus, the highest point of our site here is around 765, and then the lowest point is around 736. Also, we took into consideration the slope of the area. As you can see there, the lighter yellow are the relatively flat areas, and then the darker yellows are the steep areas. So you can see later how we incorporated the slope and the topography of the site in our design or in the master plan of the residential community. So here's the topography of the site, oriented towards northeast and southwest. And we established the site's grid based from the boundaries of the site. But um, it doesn't follow the existing terrain or the topography of the area. So what we did, we rotated the topography in accordance to the natural terrain of the area. That resulted to um, that layout. And then uh, furthermore, we analyzed on the site axis, which I mentioned earlier, north, east, and then the southeast, to provide uh, further more view corridors. So this is our view corridors, northwest, sorry, southwest is so Lake Lanao, and then south, sorry, southeast Lake Lanao, and then southwest is Maranao City Center, or the Lanao, and the Lanao Lake area. And then we also consider the wind direction, northeast and north and southwest wind directions. And then this one is not about nature, but we consider this as part of the planning method in developing the residential community. You know? So this is Rab El Hizb, or uh, two squares, or an Islamic pattern of two squares um, overlapping together. So this is how we came up with the design or the form or the urban form of the community. So um, this is the final form of the residential community. This houses 185 residential units. 
not much for a population of around 200,000, um, 200, but we believe that we'll start something from here and then it's, it's, uh, it's a step to a road to recovery for Marawi's, um, um, yeah, for the, for the war that has happened in Marawi. So that's around 60% buildable area and 40% open space. Second, create a safe, secure, and sustainable environment. First, of course, is um, consideration of the visual axis, which is to design with visual enclosure, or this is also part of the natural surveillance. So most of the activities are concentrated at the center of the area, which is the community plaza. And then from the center, you'll be able to see other people. So from on the northeast is the commercial area. On the southwest is the school. On the southeast is the multipurpose area. And then you can see directly the entrance of uh, the entrance going to the side. So you can see um, other activities. No? So if you're at the middle, kita mo yung mga sujante sa school. And if um, you're in the middle again, magita mo yung mga tao on the commercial area. And also we maximize on the entry points. So we provided two entry points. One is for uh, major entry act for the major access, and then the other one is for um, emergency and for utility purposes or, or service access. And then lastly, include places for pausing because it's it encourages uh, social interaction. Also, we wanted to promote um, shared streets concept because no? we wanted the area to be more walkable for the um, users of the site. So the shared, shared street concept, as you can see, is introduced at the middle of the area so that it acts as a, it, it acts as a extension of the community park. So the street it, it does not only serve the vehicular or the vehicles, but also acts as an extension of the community park for the people to um, enjoy during weekends or during um, any acti special activities. So those are examples of public spaces, shared streets, and public furniture. Also, one principle that we introduce is the uh, kitchen gardens. So this is uh, making or providing them edible gardens on site, and then for them to be able to sustain themselves sa community nila. So there's uh, vegetation areas all around the area. Um, and then security by design, no walls and active frontages. So we also encourage, because walls divide communities and we encourage interaction among um, the people and it, it, it provides a sense of community amongst them. So we wanted to remove the walls and then provide active frontages for retail purposes. And then thirdly, promote socially sensitive housing. Part of this is the integration of the local Islamic culture and architecture. Hindi po namin kinalimutan yung pinanggalingan ng mga Maranaos, which they appreciate and they're, they're very proud of their culture. So we looked into several elements of, or architectural elements that we can incorporate on their houses. So these are torogans, and then those are some of the artworks for or artworks incorporated in their houses. And this is Sarimanok and then Ukir, which refers to the motif of geometric form. So this one acts as a, uh, this one accentuates our um, residential community or residential design. Number two, incremental approach to housing. So as the, as the um, income grows, the family grows. So it's not, just na binigay namin yung isang bahay and then yun na yun. But we give them a sense of belong, belongingness and a sense of involvement sa community or sa bahay na gagawin nila. So they, together, they build the houses themselves para they have a sense of belongingness. And then thirdly, gender sensitive design. Because most of the Maranaos are very gender sensitive. So our design for the house, they have a separate rooms for males, for the males and the females. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, community involvement, that we involve them in every step or every process of the community um, design. So here's the example of the plan, ground floor, and then ground floor with expansion, and then second floor with expansion. So we'll be providing them the plan, and then together with the um, 
Tindig Marawi and then Liwanag Nagapaybaan to be able to brief and then uh, have a workshop with the community and how to be able to um, achieve this process. So this is an example of an incremental approach to housing. So that's a um, si single story with loft. And then that's two stories na with loft as well. So that would be the character or the typology of the houses or the residential units that will be um, present in the area. And also, we provided essential amenities of a community life through a livelihood center. So these livelihood centers, for every residential unit, they will have a stall in that um, commercial area, so maybe around six square meters. But uh, it's, it's also sustainable for them. They have their own livelihood. And also a prayer room um, interface, and it's it's basically sensitive to the culture of the Maranao since they 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 always pray to um, Allah. And then this is a pr uh, perspective of primary school incorporating all of the architectural elements, the Rogans, Okir, and the Sarimanok. Highly accessible with land, air, and by sea. It all begins with a well defined landscape and careful consideration of the area's natural topography and orientation. The main route path of the development orients a person toward the direction of Kaaba in Mecca. You can also enjoy the approaching view of where I was sitting center in Lana Lake. One residential unit beautifully embodies the history and culture of the Maranao people. The unit's very structured design, as well as the collaborative effort of donors and beneficiaries to build it, speak of the closely knit and artistic society the town's early inhabitants were once known for. The house redeems this tradition in two ways. First, by its decorative use of Okir design principles, combined with the addition of the Sarimanok, which together serve as symbolic motifs of the Maranao's rich artistic heritage. It is also a green, sustainable structure where people can eat. With the placement of edible gardens within the residential development, the inhabitants can engage in vegetable farming, which can serve as their source of income and at the same time provide a great opportunity to develop healthy eating habits in the family. The house invites the inhabitants to take responsibility for expanding the house gradually furnishing its interiors as they please. This is the proposed preschool and elementary building that will also rise very soon in the development. significance for the people. It is here that they will work for their livelihood with hopes of rebuilding their lives and becoming a resilient and united community. A variety of amenities are available to residents of the multi-purpose building. Here they can play sports, relax, and meet. It will also function as a training and livelihood center for them. From the viewing deck above, one may enjoy a breathtaking view of Lano Lake and a panorama of the Morali city center. Hope will soon rise. 
Lord's and Barangay Kilala Maragos City. Assalamualaikum. Bango, Marami. Thank you. So just a few key takeaways from the presentation that I had. That I had. So first, um, design with nature. This is in consideration of the site's physical attributes and orientation and provides adequate amount of open spaces. Second, create a safe and secure sustainable environment, which is to design with visual enclosure, maximize entry points, include places for pausing, introduce shared streets, and eyes on the street concepts, and encourage on-site farming. Lastly, promote socially sensitive housing, which includes integration of the local Islamic culture and architecture, incremental approach to housing, gender sensitive design, community involvement, and provides essential amenities of a community life. Although the proposed project may not serve the entirety or the whole of those affected by the war, we, we hope that this project um, brings hope to everyone and it may it serve or provide a huge impact to the society and that it will serve as a model development to the rest of the communities that will be developed in Marawi. Thank you. And on a side note, this is us with a cast of Marawi uh, film. They'll be producing a film soon, and they'll be showing in the uh, in the entire or the, in the national level. And all of the proceeds of this film will go to the fundraising, or will go to the construction of the master plan, and then the architecture of the of what I just presented earlier. So let's help rebuild back a better and safer Marawi. Thank you. Addressing hazards before they happen is 90% cheaper than addressing them after they happen. More lives can be saved, more infrastructures and structures can be preserved. So how can we address this if the calamity has already happened? So in, in this so I will be discussing uh, how, how Palafox Associates, uh, an architecture group, uh, along with Juchi Foundation, uh, planned for the uh, plan for the uh, um, plan for the buildings in Nepal. So uh, in April uh, 25, 2015, uh, Nepal was hit by an uh, by earthquake of magnitude 8. Point, uh, sorry, 7.5 magnitude, in which uh, around uh, 9,000 people. Uh, lost their life while Nepal was pushed uh, 10, 10 years back from, from its development phase and had an economic loss of US dollar, uh, 9.96 million, and causing 22,000 people injured. So uh, when after this earthquake, after like six months, uh, Juchi Foundation Taiwan, uh, it's it's a it's a Taiwanese humanitarian uh, non-profit organization, Tap Palafox Associates and Palafox Architecture Group, to uh, uh, for the rebuilding of uh, educational institution and health institution, for which they chose uh, uh, three uh, three schools, one campus, and one uh, health health institution. <clears throat> so I will be discussing one by one the the our projects. It was uh, it was uh, actually uh, challenging for Palafox uh, Architecture Group because uh, since Nepal Nepal is uh, uh, is a country uh, where um, is, is is a country which uh, which has a different religion and different culture, so uh, Palafox Architecture actually had to combine with the uh, Juchi standards and also maintain the ne traditional Nepalese architecture. So uh, after once we were uh, allotted for the for the design, uh, Palafox Architecture and Associates Associates Group uh, traveled to Nepal in October 25th, uh, sorry November 2015, for the site assessment. So so uh, they did uh, ocular inspection for the uh, damaged sites, 
which included Patan uh, campus and then uh, and then three schools, Padmadaya, Kanya Mandir, and Sri Adarsha. So uh, after the ocular inspection, uh, we stepped towards the uh, designing. So uh, how how we make the buildings more resilient or the or this uh, or for the future, so that whenever there is another or earthquake or any such disaster, it would actually resist it. So the general concept behind these buildings are, are, are we did the conglomeration of architectural style where we followed the uh, architectural uh, design, uh, architectural design of Nepalese, Nepalese traditional style as well as the Juchi uh, standards. Uh, in the picture, you can see, you can see that we we use the tiered uh, tiered uh, temple temple style architecture, which is uh, which is an uh, which is a Newari traditional uh, architecture architecture, and uh, along with it we uh, we use the iconic uh, Juchi Juchi style of roof, which represents the praying hand of a monk, uh, human or or uh, or a person. Similarly, we in, in our design, we try to incorporate the uh, lattice work or the akija, which is a, which is a Nevari word, which means that which mean, we which which is, which has a benefit of uh, providing continuous light and ventilation as well as for the privacy purpose. Then, as uh, it was also challenging uh, for the architects here to design because here mostly. Most of the designs include uh, concrete hollow blocks, whereas in Nepal we use the uh, clay bricks. So, and most of the uh, traditional uh, Nepalese architecture have exposed brick facade. Uh, we usually we usually use the clay bricks because of the thermal uh, thermal uh, 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 thermal comfort that it provides. Um, as we as the uh, uh, climate of the Nepal is uh, a mixture of tropical and subtropical. Similarly, uh, we also try to uh, uh, imitate the uh, uh, heavily wooden struts uh, that are being used uh, used to support the overhangs. We incorporate the same thing with our designs as well. So the uh, most uh, the materials that we we propose to use in this project are uh, clay bricks, then wood, uh, wood, mm. and the clay roof tiles. So the sustainable uh, design principle used are uh, most of the buildings uh, that we propose are elevated and have a wind tower so that there is a continuous flow of the a flow of the air. Each building is provided with cross ventilation so that the occupants can feel the uh, uh, feel the fresh air throughout the throughout the day. Also, also we uh, we propose larger windows so that we can have we can take the benefit of light natural light and uh, ventilation and also we since all of the pro uh, projects have a very uh, large area of the roof deck so we propose for uh, rainwater harvest day and also we propose the waste water uh, recycling pro process in the building and simil uh, simil similarly we also use the uh, sun sun baffles uh, sun baffles and double insulated walls in our design so that the uh, interior temperature uh, is is good for the occupants inside so this is the general look of the proposed buildings uh, for our projects uh, so go, we're going to the we're going to Padmodaya uh, higher secondary school uh, this this lies in a capital uh, capital city that is Kathmandu. Uh, it lies in an urban setting and it has a uh, small uh, creek aside besides it. So we really had a challenge of um, challenge as it, it rains uh, when it rains heavily during the rainy season. There are the chances of of flood. So we elevated the elevated the building. 
And also, uh, we had a site limitation for this building, so we provided a basement parking. But the basement parking has a natural louver, and, uh, sorry, natural ventilation system. We provided it. We provided a, a louver there. Uh, also, the culture in the uh, in Nepal is the school. In the school is like we usually have prayers in the morning, so uh, an assembly area or open area is uh, necessary. So we proposed open open space uh, open spaces there. Similarly, we provided uh, we incorporated the lattice work uh, by lattice work into the into the building. So this is the final facade of the of the building. Uh, then the, another school is uh, is Sri Adarsha. It is uh, it is quite far from the city uh, city center. And actually, our client wanted to have a football ground in this building. And the challenge here we faced in this project is like this place doesn't have a, a drainage system. So. Uh, along with our uh, engineering team, we actually proposed a, a drainage system for this uh, for this uh, project. So we were able to uh, design of uh, design the football ground in front. So uh, and also which could also be used for the assembly or prayers. So uh, this is the uh, pers uh, perspective, final perspective for the building. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we all incorporated the central wind tower, uh, the open ground floor plan, and lattice, uh, lattice, lattice works for the building. Um, the uh, last school is the Kanya Mandir. Uh, this, school, uh, this school is only dedicated for the girls in, the, uh, in, in Nepal. In, uh, since it has a, it, it has a small pond in front of it, and because of the earthquake, the uh, pond was uh, the pond was also uh, the pond was also uh, dam damaged, and then the building was also uh, building also collapsed. So we tried to re uh, re uh, bring the pond into the life by preserving preserving the pond area and proposing a deck. Uh, proposing a view deck for the pond, and this is the final perspective. In the perspective, uh, the perspective is inspired from the lower roof. is inspired uh, as the inspired from the bird ready to fly. So in this building, we use uh, large win large windows uh, and and multiple multiple roof multiple roofs, and we'll be using the clay, clay ties. Uh, and the other, and the last uh, campus, and the last building is the Patan campus. Uh, here, as we as we promote more uh, openness and openness, walkable and bikeable uh, community uh, for Patan, we we master plan it, plan master plan it, and put a pedestrianized pedestrianized uh, ways, and we uh, separated the vehicular ways for the building. Uh, this is the academic building for the Patan uh, for the Patan campus, uh, which in, which includes an auditorium. Mm, since most of the government uh, government college in in Nepal do not provide for the sports facility buildings, our client wanted us to propose for a sports sports facility building. So we propose uh, this one story building with a. Uh, uh, with a um, with a basketball court in the middle and uh, and a um, and and a uh, and a running running track on the first level. This is the science building. So uh, for the interior for the interior of the uh, of the building of the buildings we we propose we propose to have it a double double wall. And then, uh, which we have a washroom. We have a washroom in between the between the double double walls, which is actually uh, uh, because the sun will end, sun will be penetrating those area and will also as, act as a natural disinfectant for those wash areas. 
And as you can see in the hallways, we have placed the door uh, diagonally instead of putting it uh, straight. Uh, that is because during the emergencies or any such calamities, uh, as uh, people tend to rush, the the door might be a hindrance for them. So we we needed a clear hallway. So uh, so we so we try to uh, so we try to incorporate uh, the design principle, the sustainable design princi principles, and the uh, traditional ne Nepalese architecture and the Juchi standard to uh, to give back better to the uh, to the uh, to the to Nepal and their and their people so i would like to conclude this um, presentation by by quoting quoting from a uh, famous architect frank gary architecture should speak for its time and place but year for timelessness thank you uh, so, hello, good afternoon. Uh, it's been a very challenging project for Metro Davao. So, we've been doing the project for the last 10 months, and the challenges for this project is just um, unexplainable because of pressures from different ends. But for the next 20 years, that's the time span that we're planning Metro Davao. We're not only building Metro Davos, the next metropolitan area of the country that will trust Philippine economy to the next level, but the growth of metropolitan Davos is actually a growth for the entire Mindanao. So we'll be presenting to you the 2040 Urban Master Plan for Metropolitan Davao. So the first image that you see later will explain it. That's one of our proposal. Next. So last week, when we presented in the public consultation, the first, questions, the first question that we asked in our presentation was, what will be the future of Metropolitan Davao? Next. Would it be a city like this, Central Park, New York, a vast urbanization with trees at the, at the middle of the heart or the heart of the city? Next. Or it will be a city that will be filled with buildings or mixed-use community? purely mixed-use community. Next. Or would it be a city like Vancouver, wherein the high-density areas coexist with the forest? Next. Or will it be a city like this? Would Metropolitan Davao become the next Metro Manila? And to the horrors of Davaoeno, they laughed at this. Next. So this is one of the challenges that we've put forward for Metro Davao. Do you imagine a city like Metro Manila wherein you need to travel for three hours just to travel 10 kilometers? So it's one of the things that we are struggling with and it's one of the things that the Wawenos hate the most. They hate traffic and they think it's very unbearable and for them to imagine something like this, it's becoming real for them. For the last 10 months that we've been living in Davao, we've seen traffic from the eight cities before when we travel from Tagum to Davao City, it will only take us 30 minutes last October. But after three months, we've experienced traffic congestion has reached two hours to travel from Tagum to Davao City. So in the amount of less than a year, traffic challenges has already worsened in Davao City. And one of the things that they fear is that are they becoming something like this? Next. So one of the things for Davao is that they love their nature and they're horrified by this picture, an aerial photo of Metro Manila. But one of the things that we've learned for the last 10 months is that what's wrong with our planning methodologies? Why is it we've allowed our cities to become like this? Is it really purely implementation problems? So the first questions that we usually ask, what will be the future Metro Davao for its simplicity? But more than the physical development, we've uncovered something new, and we've introduced this. Um, no, it's not that it's new, but we've re emphasized it in the project. Next slide. The real goal or essence of a master plan is not really what will be the infrastructure of the future, but rather asking what, who will be or what will be the future of the Bawenyo. The question that we're asking rather is what kind of behavior do we see the 
doing 20 years from now? And would that behavior be appropriate to the kind of life that we wish to have? So these are the things that we've re-emphasized in the plan, that a master plan or an urban plan is not really about the infrastructure, rather what are the dreams and aspirations that they wish to have and what are the behaviors that takes for them to reach that kind of aspiration. And in the last 10 months, we would have um, technical working group meetings that would last 9 to 10 hours because of various arguments. But in the end, we've asked ourselves, along with the Mindanao Development Authority, are we losing ourselves in the technicalities of the plan? So in this question, very, very, in this slide, very, very simple slide, the questions we ask, what is the point of a 700-page report? If it's not being read by policymakers, it's not understood by anyone. So we go back to the root of the problem. What is the desired behavior of the future Dabawenyo? Next slide. First, uh, in Palafox, as, lo as well as in the other environmental planners, we very much support the concept of community participation. So in the past 10 months, next slide, we've actually engaged 300 engineering students in Davao to help us with our transport survey, with interviews, with community group discussions. But apart from trapping 300 engineering students from multiple schools, we've also went down interviewing 300 household families on the ground to assess and see what is the real situation on the ground. One of the things that we found out is that even if our development um, analysis shows on paper that we're delivering the services that we've done, it's good to see what is the actual condition when we put ourselves in the shoes of those living in the community. Apart from that, we had three major public consultations and we have interviewed more than 1,000 individuals for this project and we've conducted more than 15 technical sectoral consultations with various groups ranging from business to policymakers to the military and police. So these are just some pictures of the students engaging in our economics specialists. Next. One of the realities that we found out for Metro Davao is that whenever we plan cities, the first thing that the cities ask from us, we want to become the next Makati. And that is something that worries us. Because the reality of it, when we plan cities in the provinces, it's not all about tall buildings. But rather, a city is a continuum from agricultural life all the way to urban life. And with this, we were able to segment what kinds of realities are we confronting with when planning the cities. And here we found out that from rural life, from rural, um, from rural remote areas to communities inside the Shenda areas to communities in suburban areas, agri-industrial communities all have unique characteristics and unique challenges within themselves. So when we plan cities, it's not simply saying about we'll make it multimodal or we'll make it uh, mixed-use development. Rather, it's understanding what are the context and spatial or topographic consideration that confronts the people. So one of the things that we've experienced, for example, in the island of Samal, it's famous for its tourist destinations, but one of the biggest challenges for these tourist destinations is access to water. So these are some of the challenges that we're confronting with. And with this kind of model, we were able to analyze properly how should we take a look at the metropolization of Davao, and rather, should we look at it as one big Makati? And the answer is no. We need to look at it in a rural-urban continuum because in terms of behavior, people living in the rural areas is very much different from those living in the urban areas, as well as aspirations, passions, desires, and type of lifestyle that they want to achieve. Next. So with that, we had a visioning reality gap matrix we have around 1,000 um, survey sheets that we've scored and we've, we've, we've simplified the visioning concept for Davao. Simply, it's build better verde. Heeding the call of the, this current administration of having more infrastructure programs 
and we see that it is critical for the development of the country. But apart from that, looking at infrastructure, how does it interact with daily lives? And from that, how do we make it sustainable? Is it simply about physical infrastructure? Or how do we integrate behavioral challenges that will dictate our future? With that, one of the things that we've noticed when we proposed to the local government units, the first thing that they asked us is to simplify, clarify our recommendations. They are horrified to see 600 page reports talking about environment, disaster mitigation, economic statistics. In short, what they're telling us is they don't understand the plan, even if it's technically feasible. So in the long run, for Palafox, we've been refining our methodologies. How do we make our plans more possible and feasible? And with that, we've come out a very, very simple four-step proposition rather than focusing on the lodge frame model, as most of our environmental planners here would know, the outcome, output, all of those technical details. And simply put, we've placed in our tables what is the aspiration and vision, what is the behavior needed to reach that vision, what is the mentality behind that behavior, and what will be the big idea. One of the challenges that we've uncovered is that even if we had very good planning guidebooks, such as the recently launched HLE or RB guidebook, the habits of our LGUs and planners remain the same. We are planning each sector of society different from other sectors. For example, it's rarely, it's rarely do we see integration within the LGU. The, the study from environmental, environmental sector is not well integrated with the economic sector, and it's not well integrated with the social sector, and not well integrated with the policy sector. In short, for the longest time, we've been planning our cities in silos. We've been planning our cities based on sectors, but in reality, behavior of citizens does not think in sectors, but rather in practical manners. So here are some samples that we've done in proposing the project. Next slide. So I'll just uh, read one or two from this. For example, one of the things that they've placed in their visioning reality gap matrix or the visioning workshop is that they dream to have a pedestrian mass transit oriented society. In short, they dream of New York, they dream of Australia, wherein mass transportation is comfortable, easily accessible. Good and well enough, that is a feature that they want. But with that, we challenge what type of behavior do they need to have in order to have that kind of vision? And the first thing that we've challenged with them, do you think a car-oriented city or car-oriented design would be suffice in that kind of dream? And this presentation, no, we've removed the technical aspects of it, but in that presentation we showed, do you know that 80% of your road space road space is dedicated to private cars. And with that 80%, only less than 10% of Dagoweno actually owns cars. So in short, why are we affording 80% of public space, as we call it, to only less than 10% of people? So one of the questions that we challenge them with is that if you truly want to have a mass transportation oriented community, why is it do we tend to design our streets for the, only the, for the 10% to 20% of citizens. So, the behavior with that is, first, we take a look at the behavior of the Do you walk? So, to have a pedestrian-oriented metropolis is to have a Dabawenyo who does not want to waste time in traffic after work to spend more time with family. In short, we've instead of tackling traffic congestion as an urban hill, we've broken it down. What is it with traffic congestion you do not want? And what we found out are two critical things. It's comfort and it's time. And one of the things that they don't, one of the things they treasure in provinces like Davao is that family time is a must time. Meaning by 5 p.m. they leave work, at 6 p.m. they're at home having dinner with their family. But Contrasting it with the reality of Metro Manila, we finish work at 5 to 6 p.m., but we come home at 11 p.m. Where did time go? 
So these are the things that we challenge them with. So with that, what will be the big idea? First, are you ready to have or are you ready to put an intermodal station wherein you will have bus stops readily available in certain areas? But what will be the consequence? The first consequence is you cannot load and unload anywhere. So are you ready to face that kind of reality? That you would need to walk 400 meters to enjoy a mass transportation. That is the first challenge. The second challenge is if we will have a mass transportation, are you ready to give up one lane of your cars for mass transportation to save time? And that is another difficulty that they have to comprehend with. And one of the things that we share with them is that no matter how much roads we build, we will never satisfy the exponential growth of cars. So with that, are you ready to confront that traffic congestions for cars will not be completely resolved? So more traffic. So mass transportation means more traffic for cars. Next challenge. Ah, back. Are you ready to have more sidewalks and not allowed sidewalk vendors anywhere, or more of disciplined sidewalk vending. And on another hand, are you ready to wait with discipline and you and walk with discipline using your overpass, using pedestrian lanes? So in short, the physical infrastructure is not entirely the solution, but it's merely a support on the kind of behavior that we're aiming for. And this is one of the things that we're trying to develop for Davao, what will be a simple four or five step process wherein we'll be able to um, recommend a solution without even mentioning the various sectors. The sectors are there to help us with technicalities, but how can we propose projects that is easily understandable without going through the technicality of it? Next slide. So one of the things for Metro Davao is that we've uncovered of its vast um, land area. So it's seven times the size of South Korea, one and a half times the size of Hong Kong, six times the size of Singapore, and seven times the size of Metro Manila. In short, the message that we were trying to come across with is that Metro Davao has a lot of land. So just imagine what kind of economy with the correct attitude that we can maximize this amount of land. Next. So from the micro appreciation of it from the behavior, how do we now tackle the shared challenges of a metropolitan area like Davao? Next. We shared with them that in just one generation, from 2.5 million, population will become or will blossom to 4.5 million. And this is without factoring in migration rate. So this is just using um, birth rate and the reality of it, this may be bigger or this is a conservative number. Next. And 57% of that population will be living in Davao City out of the eight cities and municipalities. Next. Population is very difficult to comprehend in a relatively large size like Davao. So what we did is that we've come up with a new way on how do we visualize population in a 3D form. So next. Um, so yeah, play the video. So what we did here is that we've overlaid land use with population. And here in this kind of analysis, they were able to appreciate where are most people living in Davao. And we found out that most people in Davao are living at the coastal area. In short, this is what Davao looks like in terms of population. Play it again. So what we see here is that there is a massive concentration in the commercial center and very little population. But what is interesting though, is that even if some of the areas are zoned as agriculture, you can see areas with high population density. And one of the assumptions that we've made is possibly these areas are where the IB communities live. Next. With that kind of challenge, we've developed a application for Davao. One of the things that and where urban planners confront is, or the LGUs confront with as well, is that when they plan their cities, 
they don't know the plan of the adjacent city. So they are lost on how to integrate their cities. So what we did for Metro Davao is that we've built a software that we'll show you later live demonstration, wherein the land use plan of eight cities are integrated into one map. In short, this information tool is very helpful because the land use planner can zoom in to what I think five meters and see what is the land use of the area. So they will be able to appreciate how their land use interacts with the other land use of the city. Also, we were able to, um, next slide, I'm back, sorry. We were able to compute using the GIS technology how much land area is dedicated for what purpose. And we found out that Metropolitan Davao is currently 82% agricultural and green space as of today. And only 0.76% is dedicated for commercial space. In short, we're seeing two challenges here. While they've maintained low usage of land, there is massive concentration in specific areas. So it both have pros and cons. Next. Also, one of the important things, so you can blame. In the form of disaster mitigation, how do we, um, how do we analyze it? So here, what we've done is that using population, we've overlaid flood hazard and multi-hazard. We were able to see that most, where most people are living is actually where most of the disaster occur. And it's a bit sur they were a bit surprised to find out about this kind of data. So in this map, it shows that around 800,000 Davaoenos is highly susceptible to flooding. And with this, they've realized that most of their developments are actually near waterways. So one of the challenges that they're confronting with right now is after they've cemented or urbanized certain areas where water is natural or natural catch basins, how do they now um, confront the reality that more flooding will occur because of the site and developments that they've happened to build on? Next slide. Also, part of our map, we've added um, certain features like weather. Next. No, no, no. Need. Next slide. Also, we've added certain features that we'll show you right now that makes this software more uh, promising. So this software, um, with a contract with Mindanao Development Authority, will be launching it to public, meaning it's like a Project NOAA, but for city planning. So we'll demonstrate live how the, the system works. So right now, okay. right now here you see the land use of the area, but what's interesting here is that you created this feature wherein Metropolitan Davao, people were quite confused because there were so much studies ongoing, so much proposals, so much recommendations that they were trying to make sense out of it. So we've developed this, we've integrated this map so that they can see what are all road development projects and other projects are being done in Davao. So with a simple swipe, citizens can actually monitor the projects that are happening in the area. And on the left-hand side, they can actually see how much money is being pumped into the city. So they can see how much DPWH or JICA is putting money into the city for infrastructure. Also with this toggle map, we've placed, um, let me click this. If you're a businessman, you can simply type your address here and you will see the land use of your property. So this is a tool that can help, potentially help more businesses 
given that we provide more information. Of course, there are privacy issues that we need to deal with, with this, but it's rather how do we communicate properly what kind of information would be relevant for investments. And since we're running out of time, um, well, I'll just show a bit, some of a bit more features. Also, we've, we were able to plot all of the waterways of Davao, and we've overlaid it with land use so that they can see, actually, where areas are most susceptible to flooding. And this can help LGUs view it real time, wherein they can see if there are violations of it. And we have this one cool feature, whether it's a live weather map of the country. So we can see where the current typhoon is. But what surprised the Wawenya last week was that this tool, while it was raining hard in Metro Manila, Dava was scorching hot. It was the only place that, where it was not affected by a typhoon. So with this kind of application, um, it can potentially help more people access weather apps. There are a lot of weather apps out there, but what we're trying to do here is how do we consolidate all information in one platform. So this is the last um, feature that I'll show. What we did is all of our proposals can be viewed through geotagging. So the applications are limitless, also for tourism. So we've been encouraging geotagging all establishments. So businesses can actually put their um, descriptions here. For example, if the city has a tourism plan, what are the accredited hotels for the city? And for example, we've placed Digo City Hall and the description comes out here. So we'll end now with a short video of some of the infrastructure projects that we proposed.
Thank you very much.